help me be brave when I'm scared of the dark. I like it when you take me to the park and play with me. You make my boo-boos feel better with a kiss and a band-aid. Your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are the best. I love it when you give me lots of hugs and kisses.
time of jubilee, a time of returning and restoration, and we're excited to be in the Lord's house today. We'd like to welcome each one of you here. It's a special day in the life of our community of Mother's Day. We celebrate motherhood, and we uh, lift up God's image of motherhood and what God shows us that women can do and be in our lives as we uh, elevate what God's plan is for motherhood. So I want to read a verse of scripture or two out of the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 31. And every time I read Proverbs 31, I don't know if it makes women feel better or overwhelmed when we read Proverbs 31. And if you're familiar with it, uh, you'll understand. But we mean to read it today as an encouragement to you and a thanksgiving to God for women we know that carry out many of these roles in our life. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so she will have no lack of gain. He, she does him good and not evil. All the days of her life, she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it, and from her profits she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hands to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and her, on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and she does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you have excelled them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and God, we thank you for your will. That by your word, we know that you would have for us to elevate the calling of a woman in this world to that of being what she can be, exercising her fullest giftedness and talents and, and industry, and Lord, that you would provide fruitfulness in the lives of the women of this church, Lord, in the relationships, in their child rearing, Lord, in the things that they do for the needy in ministry in the name of Jesus. God, we understand that there are many heartbreaks that come in life. Many things that people face, especially women face, Lord, that break their heart and leave them discouraged and downtrodden. But Lord, we come today to lift up and to encourage, and God, we pray that that would be your work that you do in our hearts today, that would leave here understanding that you value and validate who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And let's continue to worship as we sing together.
see her in the grocery with her children or in the city nine to five each working day she's a mother or a teacher or a woman all alone but she's someone else entirely when she prays she's a prayer warrior down on her knees wrestling with powers and principalities standing in the gap for others for her sisters and her brothers she reaches heaven with her heart prayer warrior we don't see her lonely nights of intercession or the tears she cries with many whisper prayers we may not see the secret things hidden in her heart but the eyes of God are watching her with care She's a prayer warrior down on her knees, wrestling with powers and principalities, standing in the gap for others, for her sisters and her brothers. She reaches heaven with her heart and we'll never fully know the debt we owe her for we'll never know the evil we've been spared the many nights she's crashed through Satan's stronghold, reaching heaven with her prayers. She's a prayer warrior down on her knees, wrestling with powers and principalities standing in the gap for others for her sisters and her brothers she reaches heaven with her heart oh you have touched the very heart of God, prayer warrior, prayer warrior, prayer Thank you, Judy, and thank each one of you for being in the Lord's house today. If you have your copy of God's Word, if you'll take it out and turn with me, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 this morning. I always encourage you to bring your Bible and to take it, to make notes. God might say something to you. It's not even in the sermon that he just puts in your mind. It's a good place to write it down in your Bible. Hopefully, your mind might forget it. Hopefully, you don't forget where your Bible is, and so it's a great place to keep an important note. 
Mother's Day is not the easiest day to come to church. I realize that. We often find Mother's Day sometimes can be a day of high attendance. Sometimes it can be a day of of mediocre attendance because of people traveling to moms or sometimes because uh, the, the journey to church is a hard journey on Mother's Day for many people because of harm and hurt that have come into their own life through failure of themselves or others as a mother to not succeed, to not measure up. For some, it is because hurt that others have done. Maybe it's because of things that have happened to them. Some have not fulfilled their expectation yet of marriage or maybe of childbearing or maybe your children are uh, gone and have left you or maybe God has taken your children home to be with him. Sometimes children are hard, especially as grown-ups, and maybe they've turned their back on mom and, and aren't living the way they should. It's a difficult day. It's a difficult time. when We've lost mothers and grandmothers and people that have been influential in our life. There's a lot of emotion that comes as a baggage, even the part and point sometimes of being burdensome. Uh, around Mother's Day, we can just be overloaded with so much emotion. On many occasions, I've had people tell me at the end of a Mother's Day, uh, that it was just a hard day, and they don't know anything the preacher said after it was over. And, and I understand that. So if that's you today, and you're just uh, bearing down and getting through just to, to be here and honor the Lord with your presence, I say thank you, uh, and I pray the Lord will bless you in that. But what we'd like to do is acknowledge all that burden, acknowledge all that hurt and harm, and, and maybe sometimes all of the overwhelming joy, if you've had really great uh, maternal experiences, both personally or through uh, your parents, then that's great. But let's seek to do more than that today, to simply be emotional or traditional or cultural. Let's, let's get through that to be scriptural and biblical and spiritual today, to let God speak to us in a way, hopefully, that will uh, redeem even some of the time that's gone by and some of the hurt that's happened and lost in our lives, and even, dare we say, in our society, I think a demeaning sometimes of womanhood and motherhood, and let's elevate, according to God, our expectation, our desire, and we're not just simply going to preach to moms today, we're going to look in the Bible at a picture of a mother, who I think is a wonderful example of motherhood, and helps us in many ways, because we see she didn't have it made, and she didn't have it easy, and she'd suffer a lot of loss, but she never lost her grip on her job as a mom, her calling to be who God had called her to be. And because of that, God was able to bless her and bless her household and bless us today, thousands of years later, as we read of her story. So today we're going to use a title that will beckon to you to go way back in your mind. And this congregation may be predominantly so young that you don't even get the, the analogy I'm about to make. But did anybody grow up watching the Beverly Hillbillies? Okay, there was a guy on the Beverly Hillbillies, and some of y'all can Google it. Okay, that's the wonder of being young. You know how to find it. And it was about a story about a family that made it rich because they had some, some oil found on their farm, and they moved to Beverly Hills where all the rich people supposedly lived. And, and so they were kind of fish out of water. They were out of their element. And one of the grandsons of the family who was a big oafish kind of guy, big, strong, strapping co uh, country boy, would always eat his breakfast out of a bowl. And the bowl he ate out of looked like a wash tub, okay? And so a lot of times, if I was ever at the house, and maybe some of you would say this, if you get the biggest bowl out of the cupboard and put your cereal in it, we would say we're eating breakfast out of the Jethro Bowl. And what I want you to see is in a time of poverty, there's a lady in this story who's going to have a Jethro Bowl kind of faith opportunity. And what some of us need to do, living through a pandemic, surviving, here we are, we're all alive. Others have not been alive. Others have not made it. Others are still dying, especially in other places in the world. This pandemic's not over. But I think God would call us to have a bigger bowl kind of faith. And to realize today that sometimes the only limitation on what we're experiencing about what God's pouring out is because we need to go get a bigger bowl. To hold what God is wanting to do. So let's stand to our feet and let's read and let's introduce you perhaps to a story that maybe you know and maybe you don't. It's one of my favorite Old Testament stories in the life of Elisha the prophet. It says this, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets 
cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere. From all of your neighbors, empty vessels, do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons shall live on the rest. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, we pray that it would be alive in our spirits today. Lord, that your word would accomplish your purpose is our expectation. Lord, we believe in this congregation there are no doubt those who do not know you. Some watching by internet today do not know you. It is not your will that any should perish, but all come to know you to receive your provision. That everyone here today would acknowledge their lack acknowledge your supply and your willingness to give it, Lord, that we would ask you by faith and receive salvation. And Lord, that all those who are saved today would acknowledge and realize that you did not save us to barely get us to heaven, but you saved us, Lord, so that you could pour an abundant life into us according to your richness in glory. God, we thank you that Your resources are not scarce. Your love is not limited. And God, you are not only not willing that we would perish, but you are willing that we would have a full and abundant life in order that we might glorify you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. You're going to need a bigger bowl by the end of this sermon. That's my belief today. Faithful mothers call upon God to do what only God can do for their family. If you are a mom or a dad or you're a child, this story, I hope, inspires you to go get a bigger bowl in life, to expect more of God than what we've expected of Him in the past. As we, as a nation, seemingly are coming out to the other side of the pandemic in our local expression and experience of it, we see it still rampant worldwide. One of the things that we could introspect and ask ourselves is, during the last year, has our bowl been big enough? Have we expected enough of God over the last year or two years? Or or maybe you're 49 years old, almost. Or maybe you're older than that. Maybe you're 18. Maybe you're some other age and and you say, well, I'm just getting started. Well, let me encourage you today to expect more of God. Now, don't expect more of the government. (laughs) I don't know what they can do for you. Don't expect more of your schools. We've seen this year it's, it's difficult for schools to do even everything they want to do for you. Don't expect more of medicine. It's limited as we've seen. But what if we just began to expect for God to do what only God can do. Our story today enters in verse 1 with a certain woman who was a wife who's now lost her husband, so we would call her a widow. She's been faithful, we'll see, that this widow has done, number one, all the things that she could do in life right. She went to Sunday school, no doubt, growing up. She probably took all the right premarital classes on how to have a good marriage. She probably bought the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting, before she had kids. Anybody remember that book? You know, it tells you all you need to know. We, she probably read all the right literature. 
to be prepared. She might have taken an investment class. She probably took gardening classes. She probably learned how to cook and to sew. I believe this woman looked as much like a Proverbs 31 woman as any person you've ever known and applauded and aspired to be. We have no reason to think that she was otherwise. But what the Bible tells us is in spite of all of her faithfulness in marriage and faithfulness as a maidservant in her work because she reminds the prophet that my husband worked for you and I consider myself your maidservant too. And so I've been industrious to do my job and my husband did his job and we put in the retirement account and we were dependent on Social Security and we did all the things that we're supposed to do. Thankfully, it was still not enough. She'd been faithful to manage her household and to make sure she didn't waste things. Any of y'all grow up in a frugal house? You know, probably more frugal than the one that you run. That's what we say all the time. Boy, we, we waste compared to our parents and the crowd, compared to our parents' parents. We learn to make do. And then when you learn to make do, then sometimes you learn to make do without. Anybody ever been told that? I remember as a child. I, I'm a twin. Most of you know that. We grew quite large and fast. And so... So my mom would do the best she could to keep us in shoes and, and, and pants and, and other clothes, but those were the things that seemed to always out, outgrow quickly or wear out. I've told you the story before about my dad hated buying tennis shoes. He thought they just, I guess, fell apart or they weren't good enough. So one day he griped about enough. Mama sent him to Deprimus downtown with us when it was there on Main Street, and, and we were going to buy tennis shoes, we thought. It was right at the time all my friends were buying Nikes. I didn't get Nikes. I got Brogan boots. Lace up boots. This is before boots were cool, okay? Boots are cool. Now, they weren't cool when I was in the third grade. And I thought, maybe these things will just wear out quick. He probably heard us whispering some kind of connived and contrived plan to make sure they wore out. And so before we checked out, he invested in some saddle soap. You no, know, he got us some, some soap you know, to wax those things down and keep them supple and, and make them last a long time. I prayed, Lord, help my foot grow fast. Grow fast. My foot didn't grow as fast as my legs were growing. We'd wear uh, pants to school. If it rained and the river rose, it wouldn't have mattered. They called them high waters back then. And, and that was okay because the rest of them, Mama just patched. They'd get a hole in the knee, and she'd put a patch on the knee of them. If it had been 40 years later, she should have just saved them and sold them on eBay because now people pay three or $400 for somebody to put the holes in them for you. But, but we, we made all we could do with what we had, and then sometimes we just did without until... You could do something different. And, and this lady was not wasteful. I believe she made do with what she had. I believe she sometimes made sure the family did without. We know they got to that point in this story. She was faithful also to make requests of God. To know that when it got to the end, she needed to go to the only place that could help her, and that was to God and his body, exemplified in this story by his, his prophet, Elisha, who was the the successor of his predecessor, who was Elijah. And if you go back and read those stories, Elijah did great things, but, but Elisha did great things, sometimes even greater things than those. And a lot of the stories are, are very similar. And, and God bless me, even in the last 48 hours, studying about this, for us to remind ourselves today, as we've gone through a pandemic, where many people now begin to think of the church and the Christian faith in a sentimental, historic, passe kind of lifestyle to say oh it was great way back when when Sunday school was at a level or great way back when when vacation Bible schools were at a certain level or great way back when when the church would grow and for us to say if God used to do it God's still doing it and God will do it again and he often does it bigger than he's ever done it before all you've got to do is look at Elijah and Elisha and their stories some of us need to get a bigger bowl by the end of the sermon today because during a pandemic and during our lifetimes and during the eroding and the undermining of what it means to be godly men and women in this country and in our world, we have begun to say that maybe Christianity and biblical faith is an antique of the past to be shrunk down and frozen or shrunk wrapped and put in a historic vault. And we'll think about it in a sentimental way sometimes from moment to moment. But what God's reminding us of today is that God is calling us to live this life now. This widow had done all things right, but number two, the widow found herself at the end of her ability. Even having, ha after having done everything the best she could, she got to the end and there wasn't any more she could do. 
as I read the story, you find out there's nothing there in the house but oil <laughs> and a jar. Now, you can't even make you can't even make any good gravy with just oil, okay? You've got to have some flour to go with that. If you're going to make biscuits, you've got to have some flour to go. You can't make anything with really just oil. It's all she had. Not enough to do anything else with. And somebody in this room now, you're at the end of yourself. You've done all you can do with all you have. You look around and the inventory is low. You look around and the resources have run out. You look around and the hope has dwindled. But God still has a plan for your life. Number three, the widow saw no possibility to find help anywhere else. She couldn't find help for her husband from her husband because he died. She couldn't find help from her sons because they were young. She couldn't find help from her creditor because he was coming to claim his collateral, which were her sons, by the way. So this lady who'd seemingly lost everything was on her way to losing more after having done everything to be faithful as best she could. Her husband couldn't help, and the bank couldn't help, and her family couldn't help, and even her neighbors, well, what were they going to be able to do? But one day, as we believe was regular because her husband was a servant of the prophets and she a servant of the prophets. One day the prophet came by, Elisha. And one day this woman breaks out of her great amount of privacy and her prim and proper decorum and does something amazing. She cried out to God. She cried out for help. That's what it says in verse 1. She cried out to Elisha, I need help. <laughs> Let me, by the way, help restore your vision for what benevolence in a church ought to be. And, and praise God, I believe you're sitting in a church and a part of a church body that believes in benevolence. But I've been Baptist even before I was saved. And so I know that sometimes I hear tell of in Baptist churches, we like to create a lot of rules about benevolence, about a lot of rules, about helping people, and so much so that sometimes it would preclude anybody ever getting any help. And what you need to know is this church is here for you. If you're here in this room or you're here on Facebook, then you have an opportunity to find help with God's people. We really do care about you. But because sometimes of society and culture and tradition, people get so tied up in their prim, proper, prideful attitude, they don't want to ever say, I need help. Now listen, sometimes you need financial help, and we're here for that. But what people always need is spiritual and emotional help, and we're here for that too. This morning I told you most people didn't come uh, to a Mother's Day sermon to hear the topic of suicide mentioned, but I'm going to mention it today because here's what breaks my heart is that so many people get so desperate in life, finding no help anywhere else, and not knowing they can call out for help from the church and from God, that they go into despair, into decline, and some people in the point of life of attempting and sometimes even succeeding in taking their own life because they don't see any way to find help. And let me tell you, the devil tells you there's no help. God's telling you today there is help at the church house. There's help from God's people. There's help from God's man and God's woman in your life. And you need to stay near enough God's work and God's people that when it's God's will for you to cry out, you can say, help me, and somebody will hear you and somebody will help you. This place is here for that, and all God's people should have said amen right there. That's why we're here. We should not let people spiral into a time of despair. One of the greatest, most hurtful things about the last year, in addition to people dying of disease, is the fact that people are dying of despair, dying without hope, dying of addiction, dying of crime and murder and despair and clinging to all the wrong things because they are not close enough to God's people to realize that there is help in the name of the Lord. So I want to encourage you today, if you need help, you need to ask for some help from somebody. You need to tell somebody that you need some help. You say, well, they ought to know. Listen, they ought to know. <laughs> the neighbors ought to know and the church ought to know. Yes, we ought to know, but we're all flawed. <laughs> we all have difficulties. We're all guilty of buying into that's the government's job, that's the school's job, that's the hospital's job, that's somebody else's job. But we need to reclaim the responsibility at the church that this is our job. And so help us by saying, I need help. 
And don't rob the church of the privilege of participating in God's greatest miracle in your life perhaps ever. By the end of this sermon, I hope we all go get a bigger bowl. We expect God to do something more and bigger and greater in our church for his glory. The widow cried out for help to God. She asked God. She asked God's man. The widow believed God for the help that he had promised. Because God's man says, what shall I do for you? And before he could even let her answer the question, he asked another question. So I took a lot of comfort from this as I prepared and thought, well, I'm not the only preacher that can't shut up long enough to let people answer the first question I ask before I've asked them a second question. And some of y'all are laughing, and I'm, you know, okay, that's all right. That's just the truth about me. Preachers do that. We ask a question, and then before anybody answers the question, we ask another question. And Elisha was the same way. What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Seemingly two different questions. And by the way, if, if you ever ask for help and somebody asks you a question, that's not unbiblical. I have seen that before, too. Somebody say, well, you ought not ask any questions. I just need help. It's, if I don't ask questions, I don't know how to help you. <laughs> if we don't ask questions, we don't know how to help you. And oftentimes, if we don't ask any questions, you don't really know what you need. I run into people all the time, and they think they need this, and what they really need is this. And so we, we ask a question. We have to be faithful stewards to ask, what do you need? And then what are your resources? What can you contribute to the answer. And so what we find was her resources are, as we said earlier and read earlier, her resources were nothing except a jar of oil. And I'm so glad that Elisha wasn't so religious that he said, well, you ought to be able to take that jar of oil and go do something with it. Get back to me next week. He didn't tell her that. He didn't say, if I didn't have any more in a jar of oil, I'd just quit. He didn't tell her that. I believe the flesh part of him thought, well, that ain't much. <laughs> it's about as little as I've ever seen. We don't know for sure what he thought. What we know is what God said through him. Verse 3, go and borrow vessels from everywhere. Did you notice that? What do you have in the house? Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. She didn't have any empty jars. She wasn't poor. She was po. She was broke. <laughs> she didn't have even leftover empty jars. She was sure enough broke. He says, here's what you're going to need to do for God to show up. You need to go get ready for God to show up. Go to your neighbors. Borrow some empty vessels. I love this part of the story. Some of y'all are so asleep, you're not going to enjoy it. So tell your neighbors, so wake up, it's about to be good. Okay, just tell them. You're going to need a bigger bowl. Tell your neighbor, you're going to need a bigger bowl. Some of y'all had not even got that yet. I'm talking, Joey, I'm talking about a Jethro bowl. I'm talking about a big one. Some of y'all came into church today carrying a thimble in your pocket and thought that's all, all it was going to take to hold what good was about to come. But I'm telling you, you need a bigger bowl. You made it through a pandemic trying to go through a poverty mode. You need a bigger bowl. And, and God said, here's what you need, ma'am. You need more bowls. Go to your neighbors and get some empty vessels. Now, I love the fact that this lady was not Baptist. And her neighbors were not Baptist. Because here's what happened. If this had been a Baptist story, and maybe some of the neighbors were Baptist, because he told her empty vessels. Because had she gone to the neighbor's house, and they'd have been Baptist, and she'd have said... And they said, yes, ma'am, can I help you? And she just said something like, well, uh, I'm the widow from down the street, and I'm poor. And the prophet said, come by your house, and I need a vessel. And Lula Mae and Bobby Joe would have went out and back and said, man, I didn't know she was that poor. She needs, she wants a vessel. Lula Mae, you go help her. And so she'd go to the pantry and pull back the curtain in the pantry and there's some green beans, but man, that was a good crop of green beans. That was just last year. We'll just leave that there. And those are some peaches, but man, we sure do like peaches and pound cake on Mother's Day, so we don't want to get rid of those. Well, now here's some rutabagas from 1972, and nobody likes rutabagas. And we'd have come out with a jar, wiped the dust off of it, and for the glory of God, we'd have just challenged, Lord, take this and bless it and make it multiply in her house. We wouldn't have given her an empty jar. We'd have given her a jar full of something we're contributing, something we don't want, and something we didn't want to do anything with in the first place. 
and said be warm and be filled. And we would try to give her a blessing through a leftover contribution of herself. But that's not what the prophet said do. said, you go to all your Baptist neighbors who are going to try to give you the leftovers that they don't want. And you just tell them, God's about to show up at my house and I need a jar. I don't need a jar of rutabagas from 1972. And I don't need a cracked mason jar with no lid on it. I need a big jar. I need all the jars you got. And just give me all your empty jars. Can I encourage the church? We can help a whole lot of people <laughs> if we quit giving them ourselves, and we give them what they need to get some Jesus in their life. We don't need to give them us. We need to give them what they need in order to get Jesus in their life. Praise God for some neighbors. We don't know how many. It said everywhere. Go everywhere. Talk to all the neighbors and get all the jars you can get. And she brought them back, and she did it. The widow believed God for the help that she needed. The help that was promised, even though these are ridiculous sounding instructions, by the way. What would you do if God told you to go to the neighbor and ask for an empty jar? The neighbor's going to feel weird because they're going to want to give you the leftovers. And you're going to be weird because you're going to have to tell them, I don't want what you have. I just need the ability to get what you got. I don't have a crop in the field and we're not about to harvest anything. But I got a God who's about to open up the windows of heaven and he's going to pour down. The blessings are going to flow at my house. And I don't deserve it and I didn't earn it and I didn't design it. But God promised it and so I just need the ability to hold what God's about to send. I just need some empty jars. What a crazy conversation. But the Bible tells us she did that. The widow believed and the widow experienced God's household provision. Get this last part. With her sons. Did you notice that? Go to the neighbors and get the jars. Verse 5. So she went from there. And they did that. And then it says, and they shut the door behind them, her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out so they're in the house and the doors shut my mind every time I read that kind of goes back to the Exodus story the Passover story coming in to the household and God providing in that place but if you weren't in you didn't get to see it <laughs> you had to come through the doors or you didn't get in on it and so they're in the house and mama and two boys who learned to get by on less than nothing said God's about to do something. And they brought these empty vessels and she had to take the little that she had and pour it out. I know we get saved, it's all God. But God demands all of us. What little pitiful amount of us there is, we got to contribute it to what God's going to do. It doesn't add anything. Those vessels didn't fill not a one of them because of the oil she poured out. But not a one of them would have filled had she not poured out her oil. She poured it out into every vessel. She just kept pouring and it just kept flowing. This was not her doing this. This was God doing this. She said, son, give me another bowl. And they brought another bowl. And she poured out more and it filled up. Bring me another bowl. And she poured it out and it filled up. She said, bring me another bowl. And the boy said, we don't have any more bowls. We need a bigger bowl, mama. But too late. <laughs> we should have got more. Because it says when the bowls got full, then the oil stopped flowing. Somebody in this room said, I ain't experienced anything. God, I hadn't got any blessings. I hadn't seen God move. You need a bigger bowl. You need to go somewhere and find one. Some of you need some different friends. Some of you need some different neighbors. Some of you start starting to get close to your neighbors. Some of you need to get in your Sunday school class. Some of you need to get in the Wednesday night Bible study. Some of you need to get into your prayer closet. Some of you need to get in on what God's doing because your bowl's not big enough. You need a bigger bowl. And until you get a bigger bowl, you're going to keep getting a thimble full of faith and a sampling and a foretaste of what God can do. But you're not going to see God's provision miraculously in your life do what he's wanting to do for you and for your sons. Did you notice the fact the prophet told her and she did shut the door to her house? She shut the door. 
We can speculate on that, but here's what I want to tell you. We've got way too many people expecting way too much provision from the White House. We've got way too many people expecting way too much provision from the Supreme Court House. We've got way too many people expecting to find way too much provision from the educational houses, from the medical houses, from the houses of lending and the housings of finances. And what we need to do is get along with God and our family and shut the door. And say, God, this is the house you're trying to bless. This is the place you're wanting to move. I praise God for the song that Sister Judy sang this morning. Prayer warrior, on your knees. When's the last time you've cried out to God for your family, with your family, for the blessings to come? And when the blessings do come, to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. See, people want to find a church they can come to and get a great fired up message and a great fired up worship service and a great big to- bu- big load of blessing and, and take it home and then bless your home. Listen, what you need to do is get ready at church and get ready with God's people. But you need to go home and say, God, pour it out here. Pour it out for my husband. Pour it out for my kids. Pour it out for my grandkids. Pour it out in this place. Lord, let it come from this place. Can I just tell you what an amazing worship service we'd have every Sunday morning if people brought the worship from their house into God's house instead of the other way around? We want to get you ready to get blessed. I want to encourage you to go home and say, Lord, I need a bigger bowl. (laughs) I hope you leave here today with a bigger bowl. A bigger expectation that God can do more than we've ever thought to ask or imagine. He's not the God only of yesterday, but today and forever, God's still doing what God's always done. And he's going to do it bigger and better than ever before. He even told his disciples, you're going to see greater things than you've ever seen in my own life. Jesus said that. Are we expecting those things of God? This widow experienced God's household provision for her sons. And the only limitation in in this situation was the fact they didn't get more bowls. (laughs) The only limitation was that they didn't get bigger bowls or more bowls. Listen, what are you doing to limit God? Well, I hope we have more people here today. Well, how many people did you invite? Hope we'd have more people in Sunday school. How many people did you call and check on? Hope we'd have more people in our youth group. How many people did you invite, call, check on, reach out to? Hope I'd have more blessing in my life. How big of an expectation did you bring before God? Did you take into your house? Some of you have quit on your own children. Some of you have quit on your grandchildren. Some of you have quit on your spouse. Some of, some of you have quit on your parents. Some of you have quit on your school. Don't quit on your neighborhood. Don't quit on your government. Don't quit on anybody. You just keep interceding. You just need a bigger bowl. The limitation was in a preparation. So many times we say, oh, I want to see God do this or I want to see God do that. Listen, if you're praying for rain, you better touch your umbrella. That's what we need. Is that kind of faith to get ready for what God is going to do? The provision of God, lastly, was utilized to meet need. I'm not preaching to you today how to have a bigger house or finer cars or fancier clothes. If you want a $300 pair of blue jeans, just let me and Joey cut some holes in them. That'll help you out more than anything. I, I don't know how to tell you to, to wear all the designer clothes you're ever going to want. But I can tell you this, the provision of God that he brings is for his glory. To utilize, to meet your need, and to satisfy the requirement that you have. And to bring himself glory. Now, ultimately, I believe this story is like many stories in the Old Testament. It's a foreshadowing and a preparation of who Jesus is. I believe God can meet your material needs. I believe God can meet your spiritual needs. But he has demonstrated his love for us in this. While we're yet still sinners, Christ died for us. The greatest poverty ever in my life, when I was a wretched, lost young person who didn't know Jesus and was dead in my trespasses and sin, and I was a sinner on my way to a devil's hell because my sin had separated me from God. And the only thing that could cover my sin was the pure cleansing blood of an atoning sacrifice and the only one that's ever been able to do that is Jesus Christ himself the Bible tells us and I believed as a young boy and I still do today that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world that Jesus lived in a perfect way 
And that while there are parents and moms and dads who have sinned, all of us have, children who have sinned, this man, Jesus, never sinned, not once his whole entire life. He lived without sin. And so he was the perfect sacrifice as he died on the cross in my place and in your place. He perfectly satisfied my sin debt. The creditors aren't knocking at my door anymore because Jesus paid it all. He died for me. And the Bible says he rose from the grave in victory over death, hell, and the grave. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for me and for you and for all those who will come to him by faith. He says if we come to him, he will in no way cast us out. Some people will tell you that only some people can get saved. And I'm going to tell you this, the only some people that can get saved are all those who will come to Jesus by faith. And if you're here today and you know that you're lost and you believe that Jesus is your sin payment and he died for you and he loves you, if you'll come to him by faith asking and believing, believing that he is risen, Believing and confessing your mouth with your mouth that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, you can be saved today. It's what the Bible tells us in the book of Romans. We studied in Sunday school this morning. You can believe and you can receive. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Have you done that? Today can be the day. And when you do that, you can't hold all the blessing God will flow into your life. If you're saved, or if you're going to get saved this morning, I want to tell you this. God's not going to just barely save you. God is going to save you from wherever you are in life now, all the way into eternity. He says this, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He doesn't want you to just barely get saved. He doesn't have just enough grace for you. He has Grace and abundant, overflowing, magnificent supply of grace. There's an old song we sing, plenteous grace, he is supplying. I love that phrase, plenty. Don't you love plenty? Jesus has plenty for you today. He has plenty for your family today. Don't go through life with a poverty mode. Don't go through life in famine mode. Don't go through life in pandemic mode trying to crawl in a hole and pull the earth in on top of us. This world today needs this kind of Jethro Bowl faith. Some people that are going to get out and go forward and say, Jesus saves. <laughs> Jesus saves. He saved me. He'll save you and tell other people there's enough grace for them as well. Are you going to be defined by the poverty, defined by the bill collector, defined by the loss of your family and your identity, or are you going to be defined by the Savior who's given you everything you need? He's supplied all your need according to his riches and glory. He's done it. You need to get alone with God and shut the door. <laughs> Moms, dads, we need to shut the door on behalf of our family and say, that's far enough, devil. We used to sing an old song when I was little. Shut the door, keep out the devil. Shut the door, keep the devil in night. Anybody remember something? Oh, it's just an old silly song. Or so I thought it was. I looked up the lyrics. I didn't, I didn't realize they actually had verses. They're kind of depressing, but I'm going to read them to you, and we're going to close. Well, when I was a baby child, good and bad was just a game. Many years and many trials, they proved to me that good and bad are not the same. Satan is an evil charmer. He's hungry for a soul to hurt. And without your holy armor, he will eat you for dessert. That's kind of a rough thing to sing to a kid. But it's true. The devil's seeking whom he may devour. That's a biblical song. So you know the chorus. Shut the door. Keep out the devil. I'm calling some mamas today to shut the door and keep out the devil. I'm calling some grandmamas today to shut the door and keep out the devil. Some aunts and uncles and daddies and granddaddies and brothers and sisters, shut the door, keep out the devil. Say what God is doing in this house, we're not going to back down from. This is God's place. Some of you need to shut the door and disconnect the phones. Some of you need to take away the smartphones from the five-year-olds. They don't need one at kindergarten anyway. A conduit of poison in the life of babies. The poison of the world. We say, here, just pour it in our kids. We hate all of it, but just pour it all in here. We've educated a generation or two now. They don't know what to do with their thumbs if they don't have their phones. 
Shut the door. Stand up and say, it's for me and my house. We'll serve the Lord. Shut the door. Kneel down in prayer and shut the door. Hold out for a miracle and shut the door. See what God would do in your house if you do what God said in your house and for your house. This woman saw God move, utilized God's provision. He said, sell it and utilize it. Again, she wasn't Baptist because she wanted to put it in a CD at the bank and hold it forever. And we'll, we'll, I'm, there might be a day we need it more than today. Listen, she needed it that day. <laughs> Some of y'all are trying to figure out when you can enjoy being saved. Look at me, I'm about done. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up, quit looking so sour. He's preaching to you. Can I tell you, this is the day the Lord has made. You can rejoice and be glad in it. You don't have to save up some grace for next year to start enjoying it then. It's okay to be happy to be saved today. And to take home a bigger bowl and expect more out of God. And let him bless you and your household in the meantime. Shut the door. See what God would do in your household if you'll do what he calls you to do in your household as well. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and stand to your feet. And we're going to have a hymn of invitation. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for your people. Lord, I thank you for the women of this church. I thank you for motherhood. I thank you for the grandmothers and mother in my life. Lord, I thank you for my wife and the mother that she is to our daughter. Lord, I thank you for the ladies of this church and the ministry they do one for another. Lord, I thank you that every day we have an opportunity to say yes. <laughs> Yes to your will for our life. Lord, thank you that you saved me when I was an eight-year-old boy, and you're saving me today, and I will be saved in eternity. Lord, that salvation is past, present, and future. It's an eternal hope. God, I want to shut the door. Lord, in my home. Lord, I ask you to shut the doors of the homes of this church to the devil. To the worldliness. And Lord, that we might go out from our homes with the joy that you poured out in those places as an example of your richness and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If your greatest need today is to be saved, then in a moment like this, you can be saved. This is the day of salvation. You come. If you need prayer, we'll be here. Jerry's on this side. You can come take him by the hand. I'll be here on this side. If you need somebody to pray with you for salvation, one of us can help you. We can't save you, but we can tell you how Jesus can. If you have another need in your life, you just want to pray. Maybe it's something private. Maybe it's something you're kneeling before the Lord to get a bigger bowl and a bigger expectation for the Lord. We won't bother you. You just kneel and pray. Whatever God's will is for you, don't leave here with a thimble-sized faith. Saying, Lord, I won't be satisfied with nothing. God's calling you to reach out for more than that because your family needs it. They need you to want it for them when they don't want it for themselves. In moments like these, let's sing, let's be obedient.
God's people said amen. amen. Singing, I love you, Lord. I pray that we leave here with that on our heart to sing to the Lord how we love him, to show others how we love him, to leave here with a bigger bowl, to say, Lord, I know you can fill us up to overflowing. He's able to do above and beyond all that we've ever asked or thought of him to be able to do. This widow wasn't looking for all that oil. <laughs> she was just looking to make it one more day. But God had a different plan. God's not just trying to get you to tomorrow. He's not just trying to get us through a pandemic. God's trying to bring as many people as he can, as who will, with him into eternity. That's a whole different goal and a whole bigger prize. I thank God for you and for what God's doing in his church and in our lives together. I want to praise the Lord. On behalf of the early service, we had another family join this morning. Brother Larry and Sister Gail Osbrink joined our service. Many of you know them. They are, uh, I would say, retired missionaries, but they don't ever retire. Missionaries don't. They just kind of get a little older. Uh, they have been uh, International Mission Board missionaries. They've been here many times. They're part of the family of Greg and Janine McDerris. Uh, Gail is Greg's sister. And... Uh, Brother Larry and, and Sister Gail moved back here about a year ago, and they visited with us many times as we've worshipped through the years, and they have joined our church. And so we're looking forward to what that means for us, to be more aware and more on mission, more prayerful, more giving, more going. Uh, most recently, and still, they are connected to the Jerusalem Prayer Center in downtown uh, Jerusalem, and they've shared with that here before. So let me ask you to pray for that. He mentioned this morning the need for prayer. It's a very... Uh, peak season of Ramadan and, and this weekend was a very uh, crucial night of prayer and there's been a lot of conflict in Jerusalem and, and fighting uh, among the Palestinians and some of the Jerusalem police and so a lot's going on there and God loves those people and God is trying to reach the Jewish community and also the Muslim community with his gospel and for his glory. So we thank God for their addition to our church and looking how God's going to use them and us together in ministry for him. Brother Brian? Sunday school team, their father fell at home today, and, uh, and it just, I just talked to Greg, and they said they got him at the hospital, and they think it's a uh, CO uh, level for LA, and he passed out, and his son was just too good. Amen. Then Brother Dean and his wife uh, joined the church uh, about two weeks ago, and this worship service, most of you were here. And remember that his health is not very good at all. And so I did not know that. Thank you, Brian, for sharing. I want to continue to pray for them. Praise. We'll leave here with praise on our heart as well. We're praise the Lord for sparing the life of little Samuel. We prayed that's uh, Lacey's son. That would be Michael's nephew and Christy's nephew. And and uh, essentially they were on vacation this week. Most of y'all were aware of this story. And it went out on the prayer chain. But uh, he he drowned. And he was he was dead and they found him and they resuscitated him people were praying all over the country and in this church as well and uh, as of the last couple of days the, all the doctor's reports are clear and fine and he is a true miracle he was dead and now he's alive and he is whole and uh, healthy and doing fine and so we're just praising the lord for samuel and god's work in that family and just we just want to be faithful we ask prayer we need to be faithful to give praise and so we're going to give that praise this morning for answered prayer amen all right. Does anyone else have a word before we dismiss Chuck? Well, Lacey's brother was uh, this Saturday from uh, 9 to 12. Uh, so, uh, Lacey's uh, named Chuck Lee on our staff. All right. Remember, midweek services. There are no services tonight. We do not have service tonight in order to give you more time to spend with your family. If you don't have family nearby, uh, tell somebody. Cry out to them. They'll adopt you. They'll let you in. And uh, maybe you need to adopt somebody else's family. Uh, for yourself today. Uh, remember on Wednesdays, our Bible study. God is blessing. We have every class, we have something going on for children, something going on for youth, and every age group, there's room for you and your family. On Wednesdays, we have an adult ladies Bible study that meets in this room, an adult men's Bible study that meets in the large room that we call the Old Fellowship Hall. And men, I'm challenging you, we're falling behind. The ladies are just growing every week, and they're getting more ladies and we're doing all right, men, but, but we're going to have to step up our game. I preached to the ladies today, but I need to preach to the men, all right? So bring some men with you on Wednesday, and bring some ladies, and uh, everybody come. There's something for everybody. I love you. You're beautiful. May God bless you. Happy Mother's Day from my family to yours. 
and uh, you can begin to dismiss in an orderly way.